Hello everyone and welcome to the long-awaited Cyber Stories ranking video. I know you've been looking forward to this and the Cybermen are probably my favourite Doctor Who monster. I even prefer them to Daleks. So I'm really looking forward to going through the various Cyber Stories and telling you what I think of them. I am sticking entirely to televised stories. So no big finish audios, no novels in this one, not because I don't like them, but just to keep the list short, really. Obviously, as I'm going to be discussing these stories, a spoiler warning is in effect and we'll be covering the new series and the old series. Without any further ado, let's dive right in with what I consider to be the worst televised cyber story. Number 17 is Nightmare in Silver. Now, like a few episodes in Matt Smith's final series, <coughs> Journey to the Center of the TARDIS, <coughs> This one has some great ideas that are just sort of left hanging. Plot developments like Mr. Clever and the Cyberman's new design just happen for reasons of plot expediency and not really with any narrative drive behind them. There's also the fact that why would you bring children on a trip in the TARDIS? I don't care if you think, oh, I'm going to a theme park. The nicest thing that ever happens to Matt Smith's Doctor is his brief marriage to Marilyn Monroe. I mean, seriously, why would you bring children in the TARDIS? Also, Angie and Artie just... We get better children later on with Peter Capaldi is what I'm saying. I will praise Matt Smith's dual role as the Doctor and as Mr. Clever, but even then, Mr. Clever is probably just a bit too snide to be a cyber controller or a cyber planner. If you look back at the 60s ones, they could sometimes have a bit of a line in sarcasm, but it was very subtle. To be honest, I'm not even that big a fan of the new cyber design. It's smaller than the Cybus ones, and I just feel like it should be more imposing, not less. It's a nice design in and of itself, but I just don't feel it's an improvement to what had come before. Coming in at number 16 is Revenge of the Cybermen. Of course, another problem with Nightmare and Silver is they haven't released a 5-inch toy yet of that Cyberman, but I've got one for Revenge of the Cybermen. They're back, and they're wearing flares. Now, um, you might have expected Silver Nemesis a little bit lower on the list, but stick around, it is still coming. Look, Revenge of the Cybermen has a fair bit going for it. It's the end of Tom Baker's first year as the Doctor, and that was a resounding success. It uses the same location as a previous story, but changes the time period, which is something that has become common in modern Doctor Who. We have music from Peter Howe, who would go on to become, if you'll pardon the pun, instrumental in defining the series' music in the 1980s. We also have, for the first time, the uh, Cybermen voices being provided by the actors in the suits, which does lend a certain link between the performance and the physical nature of the Cybermen. The voices, however, aren't that great, and they just sound like a human pretending to be a robot. They're human and ro too human and too robotic at the same time. We also have the gold allergy fetish thing, which starts here, which thankfully the new series has mostly gotten away from. Nightmare and Silver. And the plot just doesn't make a lot of sense. We've got the Vogans, who are ancient enemies of the Cybermen, who fought them in the last war, but they're hiding now because they think humans will want their gold. But the only human who knows about their gold, Kellner, knows about their gold because the Vogans have told him about the gold in order to lure the Cybermen, because the Cybermen will want to come to a planet of gold to blow it up. Um, look, the Cybermen even then tie up the Doctor... <laughs> and then leave before making sure he's dead while throwing out sort of sub-Bond villain Bon Mo's. It, it's really dumb, <laughs> but it is a lot of fun. Coming in at number 15, The Wheel in Space. Pretty much this is the chase, but with Cybermen instead of Daleks and an internationally crewed space station instead of a journey through time and space. But the internationally crewed space station is kind of just full of British actors with various stages of fake tan and fake accents. The Cybermen themselves have a plan that points and laughs at astrophysics, and we get fight scenes which are very carefully choreographed not to knock over the sets. To top it all off, there's hardly any Cybermen in it. There's a judicious use of mirrors to make it look like the two suits that they could afford are actually more Cybermen than they could afford. It is fun, there are some cute moments from the regulars, Zoe joins the cast, 
but you'll be laughing at this one more than you'll be laughing with it. There's also no toy for the wheel in space, and oh, it just makes me really sad. Even though I don't really like the design. Coming in at number 14, it's Silver Nemesis. Now, I've mentioned this in the honourable mentions for my bottom five video. It's a guilty pleasure of mine, and this is the most fun of the bad cyber stories. One of the big problems for this is you've just got too many villains. You've got the Cybermen, you've got the paramilitaries, you've got Lady Painfort and her manservant Richard. Really, you should take out the paramilitaries from this story and then you'd have more time for the Cybermen and more time for Lady Painfort, who are the more successful villains in the story. Now, the Cybermen though, their gold allergy is at its worst here because they literally cower away from it when there's a few grams of it buried in the ground in front of them and they just kind of shrink away in terror. It really removes their threat, which is a problem here when we're trying to re-establish them. The design work is great and this is a really nice update from the 1982 Imagineering design that was introduced for Earthshock. What's particularly joyful about this story is the relationship between the Doctor and Ace and how they wander around the countryside jamming the cyber transmissions with jazz and, you know, they even stop just to lie in the grass and listen to it. You know, was that a logical thing to do? Not so much, but that's kind of that point of the story. But it's then divorced from the rest of the story, so even the nice bit doesn't impact the rest. It's a little bit mad, but it is a lot of fun. Number 13 is the Tenth Planet. As we head into the middle of the list here, we get the Cybermen's first story. And really, there's not a lot to pick fault with here. It's just that everything this story does so well is refined with later entries. What I find so notable about this story is the Cybermen genuinely think that they're helping humanity. The fact that Earth will be destroyed is a byproduct of a natural function of Bondas. So the Cybermen are going to rescue humanity by turning them into Cybermen. And when Polly argues with the Cybermen about what humanity is and what humanity means, the Cybermen kind of win that argument by pointing out, well, maybe things will be better when you're free of disease and, and uh, free of emotion. Episode 4 of this story is lost, but there's great animation for it on the DVD. It's also the story where we lose William Hartnell, who, despite becoming ill halfway through the story, gets some great moments as he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Cybermen. The first appearance of the Cybermen is thought-provoking and interesting. They may not be quite as polished as the Daleks were from their first appearance, but it is a thumping good start to the characters. Number 12 is the Moonbase. The Moonbase is essentially just a remake of the Tenth Planet, but with germ warfare and weather control all tied up in it. Like I said with Tenth Planet, I just feel this story does its ideas better. And we've even got a multinational crew like we'll have later in the Wheel in Space, but they are better presented. On the other hand, Polly is the only woman on the moon and is pretty much told to constantly go make coffee. However, Polly does make a chemical cocktail which kills some Cybermen, so good for her. The scenes of the Cybermen marching across the room and their mostly silent nature in the story really solidify them as the monster of the Troughton era, the way the Daleks were for William Hartnell. This, of course, is where Doctor Who really entered its base under siege phase, but there's also a feeling of a war movie here, with the enemy at the gates and sometimes even having infiltrated the base. The ending looks a bit silly with the Cybermen sort of floating off into space, but it's a real cracker of a story. And now we can watch the whole thing thanks to animation from Planet 55. Am I getting sponsored? I should be getting sponsored by Planet 55. Oh. Number 11 is the next Doctor. Look, I do not understand why people hate this story. I think it's an absurd amount of fun. And you know what? We, we generally accept for the Christmas specials that they're going to be a little bit sillier than everything around them. The Cybermen look great in the Victoriana period setting and the Cyber Shades are a weird effort to merge the aesthetic of the Cybermen, the idea of the Cybermets and the sort of steampunk aspect, and they don't really work, but the slapstick effort of the two doctors to catch one <laughs> is really hilarious. I was laughing like a drain. And what did I say 
about a week before this to a friend. I said, you know what Doctor Who hasn't done that it needs to do? It needs to do Transformers. And bam, we get the Cyber King. Again, it's completely ridiculous, but I love it. I agree with Russell T Davies that the ending is a bit flawed, but it also plays into the Doctor's sort of messianic descent that happens before this incarnation is ended. Finally, I want to praise the performance of Dervla Kerwin, who is fantastic as a tragic villain who then helps to save the day. So we're heading into the top 10 now, and at number 10, possibly a bit controversial, Tomb of the Cybermen. Tomb of the Cybermen only existed as audio recordings for many years, and it was lauded as this lost classic. It was then returned to the archives, and... It's kind of gone downhill in estimation since then, and frankly, I think this is the fate of any story that we can't see that we think is a classic. That being said, it's still really, really good. After the multinational crews of the last two episodes, it just feels a little bit lazy to have British and American good guys, okay, just British good guys, none of them are actually American, against these sort of nebulously foreign baddies and with the Cybermen just caught in the middle in a kind of tug of war. The Cybermats and the Cyber Controller are interesting additions, giving us an insight into, for want of a better term, cyber culture. And especially the Cyber Controller then gives the Cybermen a sort of mouthpiece in a way that Davros does for the Daleks. It's interesting though that the Cyber Controller wouldn't come back too often. The side mats are incredibly effective little remote control machines preying on our fear of strange insects from childhood. Even with all this though, the Cybermen don't really do much in this story. They kind of get out of their tombs and mooch around for a bit and then they put back in again. Really this is a sort of 1930s horror film. The question is not what is the Cybermen's plan, but can they be contained? We do, though, see a bit of a darker side to the Doctor, who knowingly lets the Cybermen out. And, well, we've got to wonder how many people would still be alive if he hadn't. Number nine is Earthshock. This one is often the top of a lot of people's cyber stories lists. For me, I have to look at it holistically. Some of the story's shine wears off once you're aware of the sort of return of the Cybermen shock and of course the end of this story. That being said, it's still a really good action yarn and shows that Doctor Who could do this genre of action. I wouldn't like to see it every week of course, but it's really effectively done here. After the woeful revenge, the Cybermen are back in full force. They look fantastic and they have a cold logic about them. They understand emotion and can manipulate it without themselves becoming emotional. Although maybe just a little bit at the end, but that is more for dramatic effect than any kind of plot oversight. It also goes down the list a little just because the ending is so powerful and so strong, but nothing really then comes of it after this. So again, a spoiler warning, Adric, one of the companions is killed and next week the doctor and his other friends decide to go for a party. Number eight is The Five Doctors. Look, I know it might be strange putting this one in, but it is basically a Cybermen story. There's three separate groups of Cybermen in the story, and they're the main monster in this anniversary knees up. What puts this slightly above Earthshock for me is we see the Cybermen having to improvise their plans and coming up with different methods of attack to try and solve the problem. What's fascinating about that is that there's one group of Cybermen who actually survive. You've got one group who's massacred by the Raston robot, one group killed by the Master, but the group who try and blow up the TARDIS, they're still around. So this is the Cybermen's strongest victory to date. Number seven is Attack of the Cybermen. So like Planet was for the Daleks, Attack is the Cybermen's greatest hits. It's a sequel to no less than three stories. We have all this talk about Mondas in the 10th planet, we have the Cyber Tombs of Telos, and the Cybermen themselves are possibly a remaining force of Cybermen left behind from the invasion. Despite that, it works really well as a story on its own, thanks to some surprisingly unintrusive info dumps. There's a lot of action to go around, and the Cybermen again show their skill for planning in this story, which I really, really like. 
The cyber scheme here is audacious and massive, relying on using existing elements and what they can find to devastating effect. Look, perhaps it is a little bit too violent, but it's another example of the Cybermen being returned to these implacable, dangerous foes in 1980s Doctor Who. Number six, Rise of the Cybermen and the Age of Steel. The new series introduces the new Cybermen, and as I've already said, I absolutely love this design. Something that was really controversial at the time was that these Cybermen are from a parallel universe, but I think it's really clever for a few reasons. First of all, it grounds the Cybermen in a reality similar to our own, rather than them being from another planet. It really brings home the idea that this could be you. It also means that we just jettison the really convoluted continuity of the Cybermen that have been built up over all their stories in the classic series, and we have a nice, clean, fresh start. It reminds us that the Cybermen come from a perverted form of medical miracles. And the really grisly thing that we learn is that the body is shredded in these Cybermen and just kind of threaded through the suit, so there is no going back from there. That makes Jackie's conversion really heartbreaking. Even though we don't really like this version of Jackie, she still reminds us of the mum we really love back in our own universe. Also, I just love the character development and departure of Mickey in this story. He becomes the hero that we've already known he is, but he realises it for himself in a really heartbreaking way. Coming in at number five, it's Dark Water and Death in Heaven. Look, I know this is a controversial choice for two reasons. First of all, Cyber Brick. I have absolutely no problem with it. I understand if you do, but I also see it as quite poetic that the first major alien invasion that Unit fought under the command of the Brigadier then bring him back to life so he can rescue his daughter. It's also the kind of really audacious thing that the Moffat era does. The other thing is, of course, how the story addresses death and what happens after death. And you know what? It is really quite disturbing. But it brings home the idea of how, by our standards, evil the Cybermen are and how different their view of the universe is from ours. Back in Nightmare in Silver, the Cybermen were originally silent and dialogue was only added in during the editing stage. Here, most of the time, they are silent, and the Doctor and Missy get the thrust of the dialogue. This gives the Cybermen a chance to be monolithic and imposing. But we still get the horror of what it is to be a Cyberman, thanks to a fantastic performance by Samuel Anderson as Danny Pink. These Cybermen can just convert a human body rather than having to be threaded through the suit, and that means we get that dichotomy of emotion and emotionlessness, which also is juxtaposed with the Doctor struggling to figure out whether he is a good man or not. The randomness of being human is brilliantly juxtaposed with the Cybermen here. Danny's heroism isn't due to any great purpose or prophecy, it's only possible due to faulty hardware. The dual realisation of what the Doctor and Danny both have to do at the end is really powerful, as is Danny's sacrifice, which is made for a reason that the Cybermen could never understand. Number four is Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. Pew pew pew, pew pew. Daleks versus Cybermen, it's what the fans wanted for years. I'm going to talk about it though from the perspective of the Cybermen. I really love that they are almost entirely disinterested with the Daleks unless the Daleks are threatening their plans. That's a really logical point of view. The Cybermen don't particularly care about their losses with their war against the Daleks and the humans because there's plenty of fleshy humans to convert and as we'll discover later on in Torchwood, they kind of resorted to a less permanent conversion process in order to replenish their numbers. We also introduce the idea that cyber leaders can be upgraded in the field, which really makes the Cybermen feel like an unstoppable army. They have plans and contingencies for massive losses for changes in strategy. They even form a temporary alliance with the Doctor for as long as it suits them. So much like the Five Doctors, they're not averse to working with lesser races for as long as it suits their needs. 
Finally, the Cybermen were the tool for separating Mickey from Rose, just as they separate Rose from the Doctor. And much like the Cybermen, the Doctor can't discuss his true feelings either. Number three, closing time. Yay, same toy. I really like that they kept this design for so long. Anyway, you might think that I'm very strange for having this so high, or just that I'm very strange. But I love that the Cybermen here, they're not planning a mass invasion. We've returned to a time where Cybermen are little tiny fragmented groups scattered around the universe, but all with one goal, and that is to cure us of the frailties of our flesh. That they're doing so by abducting shoppers from changing rooms is just classic Doctor Who. What a lot of people have trouble with is the ending of this story and the fact that the Cybermen are basically killed by love, but I want to speak in defence of that. Back in Rise of the Cybermen and Age of Steel, it's kind of a self-loathing emotion that kills the Cybermen. And in the next story on our list, spoiler alert, it's an emotion gun. But here, it's a simple emotion. It's the Martians being killed by a virus in War of the Worlds. It's using something so simple and universal to us as humans against the Cybermen who can't possibly understand it. To top it all off, the Cybermats are back and they have teeth and there's some great comedy from Matt Smith and Linda Barron and James Corden. This is a brilliant episode. Yes, it is. Coming in at number two, it's The Invasion. Look, this is the best classic cyber story, hands down. The show mostly belongs to the Cybermen's ally, servant, call it what you will, Tobias Vaughn, who just steals every scene he's in. Now that means the Cybermen are this background force. Again, implacable, unstoppable killers. That moment where one of them just slides into shot on the video monitor is just... Oh! It is so terrifying, and they are so good. This invasion plan feels like a culmination of all the other cyber stories we'd had up until this point, even though, chronologically speaking, this is only the second Cyberman story after the next Doctor. What makes it work so well is the vision of seeing the Cybermen stomping through London. It may take us many weeks to get there, but there is just this slowly building sense of dread, which really sums up what the Cybermen are about. There's also a tragedy to the character of Tobias Vaughan. When the Cybermen turn on him, unlike when they say turn on Kellner or Ringway, there's no sense of malice. It's just business. And that's exactly what Tobias Vaughan has made his money out of. You know, it's just business. It doesn't matter who gets killed, it's just business. So the Cybermen are taking a negative element of humanity and turning it against ourselves. It doesn't hurt either, this is my favourite design of Cybermen. The best classic story by far. Number one, World Enough and Time and the Doctor Falls. Oh my word, the dread, the descent, the doom in their eyes. Stephen Moffat and Rachel Talele just excel themselves in creating this doom-laden atmosphere which just bewitches you with the science fiction concept and then pulls the rug out from under you by doing horrible things to our characters. More than any other episode since the show came back in 2005, the first part of this had me on the edge of my seat just waiting for the Doctor to rescue Bill, and then it just punched me in the gut with that last scene. And the punches just continued the following week when we find out that these Cybermen, they're like the new series Cybermen. Your body is shredded and put in there. There's no bringing Bill back from that. And that was just heartbreaking. But then we get moments of humour, like the Master doing his eyeliner and Bill reminding the Doctor that she's gay. <sighs> There's also the tragedy of Missy in there, you know, who genuinely goes through a moral growth and journey through this season that manages to be true to the character whilst giving us hope for her. But in the end, this is a story where there is almost no hope and yet it feels so human and alive and despite the fact that we know that our characters are doomed, we root for them and we hope for them. 
My fan heart leapt with joy at the end where the Doctor delivers this breathless monologue where he explains how the Cybermen can be on Mondas and Telos and Marinus and Planet 14 and the alternate Earth and under a department store in the UK in 2011, you know. And it both creates new mysteries and new ideas while completely solving the discrepancies of the Cybermen. And it brings home that any humanoid character we meet, they have in common with us that they could themselves be bewitched by technology and become Cybermen. As in their debut story, the Cybermen think that they're helping. They're trying to save people by turning them into Cybermen. So the story ends not with the Mondasian humans being saved, but just with a brief period of respite. And we don't know how long that's going to last, and I highly doubt we're ever going to go back and find out. But that's what being human is all about. It's the frailty of being human and the possibility that existence could come to an end as you know it, balanced against the forces working against you, but staying human and fighting for that all along. Despite the trauma Bill goes through, waiting 10 years to be rescued and then being turned into a monster and being fearful that people will always be afraid of her, she still has hope. Nardole is left behind on the ship, looking after a group of humans, knowing that the Cybermen are still coming for them, but he has the hope he might be able to keep them a little bit safe. The Doctor hopes that he can persuade Missy and even the Master to stand with him and defend this group of people. And in the end, Missy comes round to that hope as well, but the Doctor will never know that he was successful. And at the end of it all, the Doctor just hopes that there'll be stars when it's his time to go. The Cybermen, of course, are immune to hope. They succeed or they fail, and if they fail, they then try again, and they try again, and they try again until they get you. But it's Bill's hope that summons Heather. It's Bill's hope that gives her back her humanity at the end of the story. It's Bill's hope that brings the Doctor back to the TARDIS, and it's possibly even her hope that revives him and allows him to continue on. This is a terrible and a beautiful story that captures the Cybermen humanity and all the madness in between beautifully. And that's why World Enough and Time is at the top of my list. The Daleks show us what happens when we allow emotions like fear and narcissism to overtake us. But the Cybermen show us what happens when we don't allow ourselves to feel emotions at all. Fear is a necessary emotion in certain amounts to keep you safe and protected. Narcissism, or at the very least a sense of self, is essential in believing that you are worthy of creating, of being heard, of being liked, of being loved. And that's something that Cybermen can't have. And that's what they represent. They represent the loss of self within ourselves if we become too wrapped up in technology and don't pay enough attention to one another. I think that's why I find them a more effective monster than the Daleks. Certainly the Daleks represent negative signs of humanity, but I just feel like we're closer to being Cybermen. We're closer to losing emotion altogether than giving in to negative emotions. But now it's time for you to have your say. Let me know in the comments what your favourite and least favourite cyber stories are, and whether you prefer Cybermen or Daleks. I'm genuinely curious to know that as well. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe and once again thank you so much for watching.